Well, um, good morning or good evening or, or good afternoon, depending on what part of the world you might be from. I think uh, I think mo for most of you listening, it's uh, it's in India or, or Asia. So good good morning. Um, I'm uh, Larry Wilson here in uh, in Western Canada. So it's definitely good evening for me. Um, thank you all very much for tuning in. Now this is the uh, the fourth of the second series of expert panel webinars that we have done in India uh, with experts, uh, safety and health experts from India. Um, um, we have a, an excellent panel with us tonight, but I'm, you can probably tell I'm a bit excited because this topic, balancing just culture and accountability, is something that I have been listening to, um, perhaps struggling with since I got into this business. And when I got into this business, it wasn't as far back as when the glaciers were receding everybody, but I have been in the behavior-based safety business for over 30 years now. So for 30 years, I've been listening to people talk about the cure is accountability, more accountability. I've listened to very successful companies saying that in order to be successful, you have to capture their hearts and minds. Nobody's ever trying to get hurt. You're never gonna get to world-class by beating people over the head. Um, on the other hand, I don't know about, well, we'll certainly hear from the panelists, won't we? And we'll also hear from you, but a safety world with no accountability at all wouldn't likely make too many of us sleep comfortably at night, right? So back to the, the title, balancing a, a just culture and accountability to make it fair. So um, like I said, this a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Now, um, just to be fair to the panelists and to all of you, I'm going to read the marketing description just so we all kind of know the breadth and scope of uh, of what we're going to be talking about for the next hour. And then I'm going to introduce the panelists and then we're going to get going. But human error is preventable in almost every instance, but it is also inevitable with enough people or enough time. Everybody makes mistakes. On the other hand, people need to be held accountable for their actions, whether they are premeditated or spontaneous. And making sure this balance is perceived as fair and just is a challenge, in some cases a huge challenge, especially if the balance has not been perceived as fair and just in the past. To help overcome these challenges, many companies have adopted the concept of having six to 10 life-saving rules or, or golden rules that have a zero tolerance component to them. Does this work in the real world? Did it reduce their serious injuries and fatalities or not? In addition, many companies have a three strikes and you're out approach. But what if it is an innocent mistake versus a deliberate violation? And if it is primarily human error, like a fall on a stairway, how do we hold managers accountable for results? Can managers or should managers only be held accountable for proactive efforts and things they can control? Perhaps, but then someone eventually has to be accountable for picking a process that works. Having that kind of expertise at a local plant level isn't cost effective. Unfortunately, having accountability at anything other than at the plant level has been problematic. And as a result, very few corporations mandate what safety initiatives over and above legal compliance the individual plant sites will do. They leave that up to them. But they do give, and I love this part, they do give advice, help, nudge, push, pull, plead. Um, you know, we're not allowed to pull hair, bite or scratch or use cattle prods, but just about anything short of that we have tried to do. Um, so how does that all work? Uh, what challenges does that approach have? 
10 corporate governance committee with the C-level member help in terms of, you know, corporate corporate initiatives. Um, many questions and only so many easy answers. Um, and this was the whole idea behind these panels to begin with, to give you a chance to hear from the people who actually have to live with the consequences of their decisions versus just getting back on a plane and, and flying back to the university. Um, but this is an extremely controversial topic. Um, everybody, by the way, um, you're all entitled to your own opinions. Um, and uh, um, Mr. Bipin Shrin is from Tata Motors. Um, I don't know, uh, Mr. Bipin, if I got to meet you in yeah. Mumbai. Um, you're, you look familiar, though. So I, I think I did get to meet you at the Tata Conclave there. Um, he is um, the uh, head of safety for Tata Motors. Um, just, well, it depends on the screen, everybody, but in the center bottom of my screen is Mr. Arun Submaranian, and he is from the AVP of HSE from Corin Mandel um, in, in Vise. Um, it's a part of the Muragapa group. Um, I've been on site there, uh, 11, 1,200 permanent employees, almost always a couple of thousand contractors that he's managing um, and very impressive safety culture, uh, impressive safety records performance. But I, I tend to look a little beyond that when I get there, talk to the people, see the reception. I mean, I certainly, you know, I, I get to see the reception for Safe Start, that's for sure. So that that's a big indication. But Mr. Arun, thank you very much again for joining us. Um, he, he's been with us on a number of these panels. Uh, just excellent. Um, we also have joining us, I think for the first time, Mr. Arun. Arun, I just got it right before. Anupam Bachi, um, and he is the head of safety, safety, health, and environment for mines and minerals uh, for the Hindalco group. And uh, again, thank you all very much for joining us. And at the top to my right on the screen is Dr. Praveena Dorothy, who um, is still uh, the uh, <coughs> head of uh, health, safety, and environment for West Asia for Jones Lang and LaSalle. Um, but shortly, she's probably going to leave and either it's Hollywood or Bollywood. Um, this, is, this is the second TV show that she and I have done in like, I think 12, 24 hours anyhow. So uh, um, Dr. Praveen, again, thank you so much and for, for being on all the panels, all the panels with us so far. So um, uh, if I can, um, Mr. Arum, let me just start with you. Um, maybe if you can, you could just tell us a, a bit about the, the Muragapa group. Um, you know, I've worked with uh, a number of different divisions, had the chance to present to uh, lots, of, lots and lots of your managers there in, in India, but I didn't get a chance to talk to them about anything like this. I mean, I must have met 50 or 60 of them, but not in any kind of depth where we could talk about, you know, cause or correlation. Um, you, you can even, if you want, um, you can be pretty frank. I mean, I've I've met lots of managers who just look at me and say, Larry, I don't care. It works for me. You know, like I, I really don't, you know, cause core, I don't care about getting into the gear works. I just believe that if I push health and safety, I'm gonna have an excellent operation. But I don't really care why. So you go, you know, away away you go, you know, kind of thing. So you can be as candid as that as you want, as you want a room about it. But what what do you think, you know, expand just beyond Corn Mandel, but what, what do you think in general leadership, you know, Murr Gap is what, 36,000 people. When, what do you what do you think in general, like your site leadership there thinks? Um, and what do you think, you know, if you were going to try to extend it to the, the rest of the managers, you know, the, the 50 or 60 say that I met there, what, um, what would, what what would you say? And you know nobody's holding you to it either, so don't worry. I won't I won't phone them up or anything and tell them what you said. 
Right. Uh, thanks, Larry. Thanks for uh, giving this opportunity. Uh, good morning to all the participants and my co-panelists. Uh, I just start with about Murugappa Group. Uh, Murugappa Group uh, established in 1900, uh, which is a 381 billion uh, worth company with more than 51,000 employees. So you can see the number of uh, people uh, that the workforce we have, and uh, we have four on agriculture, on finance, uh, on the engineering and other businesses. And we belong, uh, Coromandel belong to the agriculture business where we uh, produce phosphatic fertilizers, we are into crop protections, we are into single superphosphate, we are into uh, biopesticides, uh, healthy nutrients and so on. We also have our own retail outlets uh, around 800 around India and we have joint ventures and partnerships around the world. Uh, so this is a huge organization which works where I take care of the Coromandel fertilizer and single super business. We have more than 4,800 employees we handle. And uh, we the safety is, uh, uh, like any other industry, safety has gained and evolved over a period of time in Coromandel. Now, coming to your question on uh, what our management believes, what the top management believes, whether the excellent safety equal to excellent business, is it a correlation or a causation? Uh, definitely, it's a bit, uh, it's a gray area. Uh, I, I, I'm also not <laughs> no, too sure about no, it. You don't it's get to be a politician here, Arun. Come on, you know. But, I mean, like, it's tempting to be a politician, I know, but what do you think they think? That's true, because uh, you see, the, the definition is a bit, uh, the similarity is a bit in correlation and causation, and that's a factor. But ultimately, uh, there is a strong uh, belief that uh, good safety or excellent safety practices will lead to excellent business. So definitely, we all believe that's a causation is a cause for excellent business. Safety is a cause for excellent business, no doubt about it. Uh, but if you look at things in a perspective that uh, the, uh, the, uh, the individuals sat at a higher level in the management, that's very clear. But we, when you go to the lower level of the management, when you go to the line management, so that clarity is yet to set in. And that's the whole exercise we are working on to drive that clarity into people. Definitely, uh, the good safety is a cause for good business, and no doubt about that. Well, no, and I, I, I don't. Uh, this is very, very. Thank you so much, by the way. But um, very similar to uh, you know when we were doing this with the North American panel, um, that that was sort of the first thing that we heard. I think from uh, Anthony and Procter and Gamble saying, I, "I don't, Larry. I don't think they know, but I do think they believe. Like in other words, they." They, they believe you can't have an excellent corporation without excellent safety. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go so far as to say that a lot of them would, would have thought it through any further than that, really, you know, in, in terms of cause or correlation, right? You know, not, not from an apathetic point of view, but just maybe because they, they didn't, they didn't really think about it. Now, um, I'm not also wanting to incite a riot here, but I, I do remember um, being a speaker at a pulp and paper conference, and they had five CEOs in North America up on this expert panel, and they were asking all of them, you know, what they were going to do for their safety initiative next year. And almost to a person, every one of them was talking about accountability, um, different stages. Like one, one CEO talked about how this year we are going to make all of the site managers accountable for safety performance. At another company, a little further along in the journey, they were going to make all of the supervisors accountable. And he said, and next year, we're going to make all of the employees accountable. And I said, well, would you bet me a thousand dollars that you would never slip and fall this winter one time in Canada? 
And they said, no. And I said, well, how are you gonna hold your employees accountable for slipping and falling? Mm -hmm. Now I realize you don't have as much ice and snow in India, okay? So, you know, that example isn't gonna work as well for you, but you know, when it comes to things like personal injury, I actually don't find too many executives that wanna hold themselves personally accountable. But um, like I said, this is not about your opinions, Larry. This is about your expert panel. So Dr. Pravina, um, let me just ask you the same question. Now, JLL, I, I know, is all over the world, 90,000 employees. So you, you don't have to go out on a limb and say what you think every one of them believes in or, or not. But um, uh, maybe you could start with uh, your, your 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 group, and um, you know, at least uh, as far as you could go in India. What are they? Safety X. Your company believes in safety excellence. Um, you've you've achieved a fair bit of it. Um, again, I've I've been on site at her operation. Um, fabulous place, fabulous culture. So, do do they believe it's cause, or do they think it's correlation, or or well, let you tell us. First of all, thank you, Larry. Thank you for this uh, opportunity. Oh, you're and, welcome. And uh, uh, regarding uh, JLL, Jones Lang Lessel, as you said, it is a global company, global real estate investment and uh, services company. And uh, in India, we are spread across almost uh, 30 states and union territories. That means uh, we have our client presence. And uniqueness of this team, uh, in India, we have got almost 12,000 uh, employees. Uniqueness is um, all our employees mostly are actually at client side. So we are highly decentralized team. And um, um, I do believe that uh, uh, it is the cost. They, they think of it as a cost. They don't think, they realize it to be the cost mainly because uh, we have obligations to our clients regarding the services we provide and safety, uh, environment, health and safety is one of the key parameters. And we get um, reviewed on monthly basis. Uh, I mean, we have constant review with our client partners, with our vendor partners and all. So that itself uh, is a, a key point which uh, makes everybody aware in the team that uh, we have to perform. Otherwise, it will have some in implications on the uh, contractual obligations and all. So it is being constantly reminded of by the managers, by the supervisors mm -hmm. and all. Having said that, um, uh, I wouldn't say it is uh, like 100% uh, excellence have been achieved even though the safety culture is good and all. So we are still working towards to increasing and going towards the excellence. Uh, so it is a continual process, Larry. I, I wouldn't say that at any point it is all 100% touching. So it no, no, is no. a continual person. Well, no, and it's, it's, it's as, soon as, you, as soon as you start thinking you've achieved it and you let your guard down, you're gonna, bad things are gonna happen, right? So, you know, the... Yeah. The, the sad truth is, is that you, you never really get to relax comfortably for too long. Um, you know, you get to have a cup of coffee, and then that's about that's about it, right? Complacency <laughs> sets in. Um, anyhow, uh, so I they I think it's a bit customer driven as well too, right? In other words, you know, your your safety performance is, is also part and parcel of how you get contracts, why they pick you, yes, and, yes. and so on. Mm. The show we did, by the way, earlier today, everybody on, on Larry Wilson Live with Dr. Pravina was achieving world-class safety performance with a decentralized workforce. Um, it, it'll be available as a podcast. Um, so uh, however you found out about this, just contact them and uh, we'll maybe be able to flash it up on the screen at the, uh, at the end of the webinar. Um, and, and you can also listen to the podcast. Okay. Um, if I can, then, Mr. Griffin, um, I, I don't know how much you need to tell everybody about Tata Motors. Probably everybody in India listening knows more than I do, and I think I know a fair bit. Um, I, I must say I've been tremendously impressed with the Tata Corporation. 
um, I, you know, I got to speak at the at the conclave there in, in Mumbai. Uh, it's excellent group of folks. You know, I didn't get to talk to everybody. I think there was 150 or, or some odd folks there. Um, like I said, you 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 look you look awfully familiar, but I'm not not 100% sure if we if we met there. But tell us a bit about Tata Motors. Um, do the, do the managers and supervisors of Tata Motors think that safety excellence is cause, you know, versus correlation? Uh, have they put any of that, you know, in terms of the human error component together? Um, and also, fair enough, like everybody else, fair enough to say whether, um, you know, they really don't care that much whether it's cause or correlation. It just, you know, they know it works, so that's what they go with. Any and. and but but go ahead um, if you can, Mr. Bippen, and uh, tell us maybe a, a bit about how many people at least work at Tata Motors in India. Uh, you could start with that if you would. Yeah. So uh, good evening, uh, Larry, and uh, good morning to all my co-panelists. So first yeah. of all, uh, my uh, you know uh, sincere thanks to be a part of this August gathering, and as a panelist, I can you know I can I'm humbled to be here. So Larry, uh, actually, you told about you know you had some association with uh, Tata Group of Company 150th year. We had a conclave, and we we keep on having such learning and sharing session at Tata Group and Tata Motors. So uh, I mean, uh, all of you know Tata Motors, but just to give you a brief about Tata Motors, we are part of you know 113 billion of Tata Group, and uh, this Tata Motor itself is more than 35 billion. We have close to you know 76k employees. Uh, across the globe, and we have actually presence in uh, global footprint is around 100, 125 countries. So you know, Tata Group is from salt to software, and Tata Motor is all about automobiles. You know, it is actually offering solutions uh, from 0.5 ton to 75 ton vehicle, and uh, our presence is there in uh, India defense sector. So uh, you know, this Art Nirbhar Bharat, uh, which is actually now a buzzword here, um, you know, in Art Nirbhar Bharat. So we are actually contributing to the society, to the community. More so, when we are actually talking about, you know, society and community, our efforts are not, uh, you know, within the plant. It is actually all stakeholders. So, uh, you can understand that, uh, you know, in organized, unorganized sectors, the safety remains a challenge when the perception of risks is totally different. People in India, uh, you, you know, my Indian co-panelists will agree that, there is a you know high risk appetite. People tend to risk, take risk. So how to change the mindset? This is the biggest uh, you know challenge we had faced. And uh, I am privileged to be with Tata Group uh, with more than 33 years. Uh, prior to being a safety professional, I was actually in the area of manufacturing operations. I was in projects. I was leading quality. And then uh, finally, you know, this is my. Uh, last phase of my career, I'm in actually safety excellence, and I'm enjoying it most actually. You know, in the right from the day one, I joined Tata Motors, and a lot of you know strong values uh, Tata has towards uh, you know uh, this is a very strong foundation. Our uh, you know uh, legendary leaders like GRD Tata used to talk. Then when you have to you are reaching a safe a shop floor, and there is maybe a difference of opinion. You know, somebody saying you know this is safe, somebody saying it's not safe. So it has to go towards the greater side of safety. So that's the you know the beginning I had I, you know I, I was very I was very impressed with that when I first heard that like and they said that was you know it was over seventy years ago that uh, yeah that, that you know I don't want to say old man Tata but I mean you know the however many generations ago was was saying that but like so like again you know there's like. All of you are here because your companies are excellent. What I'm wondering is, is do, you know, do they think it's cause or, or correlation, right? Because for for so many managers, safety like you've got to put a guard on the sprocket, but the guard doesn't make the machine run any faster, but it costs money. But you know, so they they understand that safety is important, but they haven't made the connection that you know over 97 percent of the time, you know, there there's going to be an error and a hazard or a source of hazardous energy. So if we focus on the error, 
and we're going to improve quality production, customer service, and safety if the people are moving. Now, some leading companies have sort of figured out the human error, human factor cause, and a lot of them are still just, I think, in the correlation end of things. But we'll we'll move we'll move on to you, Mr. Anna Pam. Um, what about Hindalco? Um, uh, what do they what do they think in terms of the supervisors and managers? I mean, safety. Um, uh, if I'm actually there is some network issue, can I stop my webcam and uh, go to the audio mode because uh, a lot of network issue. I'm uh, your. You could well, you could try bipping um coming out and coming back in again, right? Okay. Um. Mr. Anapam, let me let me ask you about Hindalco and the managers there. What do they think? Cause or correlation? Yeah, uh, thank you, Larry. So, uh, Larry, actually, <laughs> am I am I audible now? Yeah, you're you're audible, but we can't see you. So maybe can you go out and come back in again? Try come. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Anupam. So, so Larry, uh, Indalco is primarily in uh, metal business, uh, mainly in uh, aluminium and copper. And we have mines, 27 mines, both uh, bauxite and coal, uh, to uh, supply the ingredient to our plants. Uh, the thinking of our leadership team is very much clear on it. This is just a perception. Whether you perceive that there is a cause and effect relationship between safety performance and the business performance, or there is just it is a coincidence and no correlation. And perception leads to the belief, and belief leads to the behavior. So if you perceive that uh, there is cause and effect relationship between safety performance and business performance, you will put more effort on the safety. Uh, so your safety standard will be better and better. I, I, and I if agree. you perceive I, I, that, I agree. Totally. Uh, if you perceive that there is no correlation, no, uh, this is just a coincident uh, between safety performance and business performance, then you will not put much effort on safety, and your safety standard will be deteriorated and it will go down uh, uh, by time. So our uh, safety, our leadership team is very much, uh, uh, say, firm on this belief that this is a cause and effect uh, relationship between safety performance and business performance. And they demonstrate it. Uh, our uh, managing director himself is taking uh, the safety review every month on uh, second Tuesday and for two hours, about two hours, is uh, doing the safety review. And on that review, uh, beside the uh, discussing the learning from the incident accident, we are discussing more on the, our effort, that is leading indicators. And uh, if there is any uh, such per uh, perception perceived that uh, it is not a um, cause and effect relationship, then uh, we take them uh, into the task uh, we do counseling and uh, we make them convinced that there is a relationship between safety performance and business performance. And uh, we observe them until they really believe that uh, there is cause and effect relationship between uh, safety performance and business performance. Okay, okay, let me, um, let, let me, let me come back to you and, and get, get a bit more of the detail sort of in the second round. So. Um, you know, I, I don't know, Mr. Bippin, can you hear me? Are you, you were back for a second. I, I feel bad about asking you to go out and come back in because maybe now we're never going to see you again. Oh, well, um, it's, it's technology and the internet for these things. It's, we, I, we all know it's not perfect. Um, but, um, Mr. Room, let me, uh, let me come back to you. Um, I don't know, give us some of the depth, uh, background, or a story, um, you know, in terms of your managers there, you know, critical human factors, critical errors. What have you also seen in terms of not just injury reductions, because I know that that's been good, but, you know, um, 
like I, I was thinking more of, you know, um, unscheduled downtime, uh, you know, on-time on delivery, uh, customer complaints being reduced, um, projects being completed on time without unscheduled overtime. Um, it, it, it's difficult, more difficult in a process industry than say, for instance, in, in an assembly line or in a factory where you're you're shipping truckloads of stuff out, and you know you could ship three truckloads of materials to your second best customer instead of your best customer just because somebody didn't read a barcode right. Um, but uh, you know, in a process industry, it's a little difficult, more difficult maybe. You know, but. Were there any, any metrics there, like unscheduled downtime, um, you know, things like that that happened at the same time as you were doing the training on human factors and critical error reduction techniques that, that got some of the managers there to see, you know, more, more, of, the, more of the cause versus just a, an overall correlation? Uh, Larry, I think... Um there is a there is a gap in uh, in the at the uh, line level to connect the dots between the uh, downtimes related to incidents uh, or the lack of uh, uh, lack of involvement of actually uh, sorry time. i am not able to i am not able to get you properly i mean there is a network issue probably uh, yeah, begin. So, uh, uh, basically, what I could, uh, am I am I am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Bipin, you're audible. Bipin, you're audible. We, we we can we can all we can all hear you. Um, if you want to just sort of, I, I don't know, it'd be great if we could have a picture of you somehow on the screen at least. But um, let me uh, let me just carry on, and I'll I'll, I'll come back to you if you can hear us. And then when when I get to you, you can you can just talk, Mr. Bippen, and we'll uh, we'll, we'll we'll listen. Because um, I I got, I got the initial part from you before that you know your managers were sort of uh, you know certainly on board with the belief in the safety excellence. I couldn't exactly tell you know how many were caused versus versus correlation. Um, I'm just uh, I'm just cross examining Arun now, <laughs> but. Um, uh, be, well, because I met, I've met some of the managers there, right? But I didn't get, it, it's my own fault too, because I didn't get to start asking them, hey, you know, have you started noticing some of this happening as well? Because it should be if, if everything's working right. And it looked to me like everything was working pretty well there, right? So, um, but you were saying there's a bit of a, bit of a gap when you get to like we're about the right. super first line supervisor level right so right. Uh, larry i just want to give some examples to make yeah. it very uh see for example that uh, you need all functions to get involved on their role that they play on safety one good example i was just in a meeting before i came to this webinar and uh, one of the examples we took there was a commercial guy sitting and negotiating on a raw material uh, without looking into the spec, going for a low value, and then you get a raw material which has uh, 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 dust in it, which can create a fire. And uh, it literally happened that when they're conveying this material through the conveyor, and the fire systems were put off because they didn't use it for a long time, the dust got a heat from somewhere from the bearing or somewhere. The whole conveyor system burned on, burned off. The production was stopped for number of days so they could rectify it. So sometimes you feel that uh, certain functions are totally away. It's only the operation maintenance or the technical service which are directly involved uh, into a safety uh, role that they have to play. But you also see that sometimes the commercial person could just jeopardize your whole uh, operation by not considering a safety factor into his decision making. So that's a very, very typical example I so, thought of that how that, how this yeah. No, that's I yeah, mean, but that that, that is that's what I'm doing. You know, what I'm think doing. about maintenance. Um, you know, like it's I remember going at uh yeah. it was an oriented yeah, strand yeah, yeah. board sure, mill. Sure, sure. And um 
it's five well yeah. 4 59 the shift's over at five o'clock we're all walking out to the parking lot and the the maintenance shops at the very back of the building and the parking lots in front of the cafeteria to flow you've got to walk all the way through the plant and when we walk by the compressor room i'm with three maintenance guys and one guy stopped and he listened and then the other guy listened and he said you hear that he goes yeah and then the one guy looked at his watch and then he said the other guy oh it'll probably be all right till tomorrow and he goes yeah and they left and then the press went down at about four o'clock in the morning and both of those guys got called in in the middle of the night to go fix it, but they lost $84,000 worth of production. And all I remember thinking was if it had have been three fifty nine, if he didn't have to go pick his daughter up at school or at soccer or whatever it was, rushing kind of thing, complacency, this probably never would have happened. So. You know, is he, you know, you've ever been driving your car, it makes a funny noise and you kind of hope maybe if I ignore it, it'll go away. So, I mean, you know, we know human factors come into maintenance. They they come in, you know, to, to unscheduled downtime. Um, but there's been a reluctance to, to sort of address that head on. But when they get to see evidence of less of it, you know, it usually lights them up a bit, right? You know, and they start to take notice. Obviously, if you light a conveyor belt on fire, anybody's going to take notice, and you can hopefully make the point. Make the point with that. Um, anything else that you've been doing to sort of connect the dots for your first line supervisors, Arun? Yeah, see, the, the one point which I just want to make is that um, I've been a lot of uh, reading a lot of the books on by Trevor Kletch and uh, where we the engineers view on the human error part if you see the accident investigation uh, quite a lot of investigation land up on a human error but we don't deep dive to see what other improvements on the design side or on the uh, uh, training side or the uh, procedural side or on the uh, the way we plan our activities uh, what improvements we can do on those areas just uh, just by stopping at an investigation at a human error, blaming a poor guy or a victim of an accident, uh, it's, it looks like uh, the managers and others are not human. Uh, only the guy at the down uh, bottom level has a responsibility and owns it. And as you rightly told, I see many incidents happening due to rush and frustration, complacency in all these. And I, we ourselves have experienced a couple of our incidents uh, when we analyzed, we found it all was just before a holiday. Either the mm -hmm. guy was uh, on a vacation mood, want to leave, finish his commissioning activity and leave, or uh, he was uh, going on a long holiday with his family and he was in a hurry to close down his activities and he stops it somewhere, leaving it unsafe for somebody going to come and take over the job. So we have experience and we want to address, we try to address these problems uh, one by education, one by following up the critical scenarios, but to sustain those uh, efforts we put. Uh, what I see that immediately after the incident, quite a lot of actions are put in place, people try to follow it up, and then it fades away slowly. There are no champions to sustain it. There's no involvement, commitment by the people, ownership to take up, and uh, people even, I see sometimes there's no remorse that people say this accident has happened because of me. Uh, there is a, a, a sort of complacency that comes in. After a few days, people go back to the uh, previous conditions and fail to sustain the corrective actions that are put in place. That's well, what I see. Definitely. The, uh, uh, you know, I remember doing a thing for carrier air conditioning in Mexico, which, you know, it's a campus of five plants. I think it's around 3,000 people. And the, the head engineer for the whole campus said, you know, the reality is these human factors are not going to go away. So just like, you know, with ergonomics in the back, you know, I'm going to have to try to redesign every machine and every process here so that as best I can, I can engineer out the rushing frustration, fatigue and complacency, because just like when people are different heights, you've got to have a different 
height workstation because they can't you can't redesign their back right so you know he was a german guy he's very accepting of the reality of it all right you know that uh hey you know th th this is never going away i mean this is part of life so let's see what we can do from a system point of view to negate as much of it as possible can you know can you make it so that maintaining this machine is not a frustrating process or it doesn't hurt your back you know because then it'll be better but you know that's that evolution is as definite has definitely taken a while um dr pravino let me uh let me ask you um if you were gonna if you were having you know talking to a safety professional that's having trouble getting support uh, from a quality manager there is a network issue one one actually or a production superintendent um, um like especially if they don't know that you know the safety excellence is and business excellence or i can't imagine anybody at jsl jll not knowing it but if if you were talking to a supervisor outside what would um is there anything that you could sort of say to them like hey you know um you know go and look for instance at you know you're at shipping errors look at errors in your finance department um you know talk to the people about these four states realize that it's more systematic than just safety i, I don't know what if if somebody was coming to you saying look i can't get any help from my production superintendent or my quality superintendent, what, what advice could you give them? So uh, from my previous experience in Intel, where I started out with a system or where there had been no um, procedures or safety related aspects. Uh, in that case, uh, I myself was experiencing uh, resistant towards implementation of procedures and all in uh, my previous experience. So in that case, uh, it is always better. Uh, like uh, during the video sh show, I was talking about having influences, right? Mm -hmm. So I start with discussions with the leaders. So we need to discuss with the leaders who has got influence to uh, influencing capability, who can influence the managers and supervisor. So start with them. And uh, once we gain their confidence and understanding about how the safety should be looking like and uh, why it is required and all, then uh, we go to the next level. of. Uh, so we are basically creating influencers. I'm being the first influencer. I'm creating uh, the next level of influencer, leadership level. And then uh, we go to the manager and then the supervisors rather than going the, uh, in the reverse order. So many a times what uh, some of us do is we straight away go and talk to a supervisor uh, about a new procedures and all, uh, trying to implement from there. But when it comes from a leadership level, top-down approach, it is getting implemented. So I have seen it be, uh, being easily uh, taken up uh, and people uh, actually go beyond and try to showcase, yes, I have implemented it. Uh, I'm the first person to implement, see how, how I have implemented it and all. So uh, that uh, that's an approach uh, I usually take. Well, I mean, it's, if if you can if you can get the if you can communicate with and, and get the support of the senior managers to to do that. Um, like I said, I've, I've I've talked to a lot of them and said, well, look, you know, do you really think anybody's trying to get hurt? And they go, no. Do you think anybody's trying to make any quality errors or production errors? And they go, no. And I said, so would it be likely they're caused by the same things, you know, like rushing, frustration, fatigue, complacency? Um, you know, and I, I usually have to get them kind of like thinking along those lines. And then I'll usually have to get them to think about an incident like, you know, the one you just told me about where you ship three truckloads to your second best customer instead of your best customer you know what did what did you do other than tell that employee if you do this again you're fired i mean if that employee had a back the fork truck off of the loading dock and got seriously hurt 
there'd be all kinds of root cause investigation and analysis and so on, right? But if, if that guy had made two or three of those mistakes in the last month, he might not get another warning, right? That might just be it. So I find that, you know, there's a, a bit more maturity around justice, if you will, with safety than there is for just a, an error, right? Like, you know, making a big mistake that costs the company a lot of money, right? Almost gets invariably triangulated to the person who made the error and their their rap sheet, like how many errors have you made in the last little while? How many appointments have you missed if you're a salesperson and so on, right? So, um, you know, it becomes, it, it becomes, I think, even more personal outside of safety that they don't even want to use some of the learnings that, that we've figured out the hard way. But um, as as you get to the like you know the the cause the cause versus correlation, um, when somebody's coming, well, I'll, I'll, I'll move on, Doctor Provina, because I'm, I'm I agree with what you, you what you say is right. You've got to get to those folks if you're going to get to the people below them. I'm just sometimes getting to those folks when they just think that safety is a a cost of doing business. It, it's difficult to get them to see what's 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 in it for them. Um, but uh, I don't know if Mr. Bippin's going to come back. So, um, Mr. Anapam, if I can, I'll, I'll just I'll just come back. To, I'll just come back to you. Um, what what has worked best for you in terms of getting getting executives to see the connection? um you know into human factors and human error and how that you know that human factors and human error dramatically affects the reliability of the organization and you know i realized that the mining industry you know i guess historically has had a bit of a bad reputation in safety because there's been you know numerous disasters all over the world for the history of the history of mining and it's a highly regulated industry which can sap a lot of motivation from supervisors and managers because of how forced everything is but it's you know it's 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 all you know everything everything's coming around um you know so how do you get how do you how do you get your executives to see the you know the the connection cause between safety excellence and business business excellence, like any any tricks any tricks of the trade that the people watching can quite frankly steal from you. <laughs> I think very uh, it is not one uh, thing but uh, combination of three things that we have taken, and uh, the first thing is that. Uh, concept of task force and subcommittees. Task force are the uh, team uh, made from the every critical uh, task. For every critical task, there is task force. Again, for every management system, there is uh, subcommittees. And these task force and subcommittees, they are meeting uh, every month individually. Uh, they are recommending what, how they can do the best, how they can uh, make their job more safe and, uh, and also performance, improve the performance. So they are recommending uh, in their respective task or the system. Then that those recommendations are being discussed in the unit safety board. So unit safety board headed by un head of the unit. So most of the things are solved there. If it is not solved uh, by the unit safety board, it is escalated to the apex safety board where uh, our managing director himself is uh, reviewing the thing. So any recommendation uh, of safety improvement or performance improvement in the, at the sub floor level is going to the managing director if it is not solved in between. So, so this is one of the things. And another thing is 
that uh, we did a uh, behavioral survey uh, last year, not last year, uh, it is in 2019, last year we could not do much, much on this. Uh, in that behavioral survey, actually there were uh, three surveys. One is the safety climate survey, where uh, people came and visit our mines round the clock and observe almost all uh, routine work as well as some of the non-routine job and what are the risks there, what are the mit uh, mitigation plan is there and how the, our people is using those measures whether they are using it uh, or they are doing shortcut, they observe that thing silently. Then based on those uh, risks profile, they prepared some questionnaire to judge the perception, safety perception of our uh, people. Say worker, contextual worker, our worker, our supervisor and our management staff. So these four category people are uh, say, were, uh, subject to those questionnaires. Those uh, who have the company email ID, they get it online and they submit the answer online to them. So we don't know what is those answer. And those people who don't have the email, they came and they uh, talk to the worker individually one-to-one -one and get that ans those answers. So, and after that, we did another survey is the 360 degree leadership survey, where the uh, for any leader, uh, the their subordinate, what they are uh, perceiving as a safety person and their peers, their uh, say bosses, how they perceive him as a safety leader. Those survey was conducted up to a manager level from the top of the business head to the uh, manager level. So after these three survey, we analysis, analyze the gap in perception, uh, safety perception, whether people are thinking in these four categories, the contextual worker, our worker, our supervisor, and our uh, management cadre people. Were you, were you asking, every level, were you asking them? Gap? Were you asking them questions about safety, like specific questions in the surveys about, you know, say the safety excellence, like equal business excellence in, in any of that stuff, like what, you know, to see where your employees were at as well. And so we're, I, I, I want to, because I think we got maybe a chance for Mr. Bip and I think he might be connected. I'm going to see, but did you get it that Like, do you think, you know, Arun was saying that, you know, at the at the line supervisor level, the connecting the dots was a little, you know, they were working on it. Um, would you say that you got the dots connected all the way down to the 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 worker level with with these different three different committees and the, the surveys? Yes, yes, uh, there are gaps in the contextual worker, much wider gap than right, the, right, our worker yeah, okay. and again uh, in supervisor level. And based on that, uh, we, we uh, form one uh, safety commando concept. So the safety commando, this team is formed from uh, combining the all the safety uh, task forces and subcommittees. They are selected based on their physical fitness, their skill, their psychometric test, and these safety commanders are uh, working in the principle of four, three R, say reduce, okay, all right. okay, well, let me, and recover. Okay, well, let me let me if I I, I hate to stop you, but I want to I I think Mr. Bippen, are you can you hear us? Are you are you connected, Mr. Bippen? Because if if you are, um, I I'd love to just ask you because safety. It isn't usually thought of as being the same thing. Um, I don't even want to go so far as to say as being as important as quality uh, or reliability or customer service. Certainly, um, uh, my experience with with automotive industries uh, in North America and Japan, um, quality is pretty important. Um, but they haven't at least in north america you know not so much with the J the japanese are better but um it has human error 
as, as being a kind of a common cause, human factors being the precursor states to those errors, has that started to be considered seriously in the automotive industry in India or is the quality world still like, you know, Dr. Deming 8515 and the, the system is omnipotent? Um, where, where, would, where would you say, where would you say the, the automotive industry, well, start with Tata Motors and then if you can, maybe just expand a bit to where you think the, the, the automotive industry is in India in terms of human error, human error, cause versus correlation, you know, safety, excellence, business excellence. Yeah, thanks, Larry. Actually, I'm uh, really sorry that why because of network I got uh, disconnected for some time. Uh, as you rightly showed, told about, you know, the uh, focus on quality and not on safety. So that was actually uh, uh, earlier uh, story. But now, you know, uh, the, there is a very good analogy between, you know, quality and safety because, uh, you know, uh, they cannot be separated as well. You know, the uh, anything what you do excellence in quality also actually uh, leads to safety and you have rightly told about the human error so uh, this occurrence and recurrence prevention uh, actually uh, that is what uh, we started the tool of called sarka human error root cause analysis and actually earlier we have been using this tool of harka uh, in the incident investigation you know for recurrence prevention but now you know proactively we started using this tool or our, uh, you know, HERA exercises, you know, uh, we make a very robust HERA, uh, right from the, you know, uh, starting of an act of activity, breaking into sub-activity level, understanding each and every, uh, you know, micro uh, aspect of any activity, and what error pro uh, probably we could make, actually. There are 16 types of errors we actually normally consider, and there are actually seven types of, uh, actually, root causes, and there are actually five types of, you know, mitigations uh, of uh, those uh, actually cause root causes. So we, we have tried to build in uh, on the, you know, all the activity. We started, uh, you know, activity, all activities which is being done either by uh, our uh, employees or contractor or vendor, they all have been put in a robust process of uh, HERA. Actually, They're managing risk, actually, it is very, very important rather than managing safety. So that is the methodology we have started adopting and we have a very good IT infrastructure on which you know all seven plants of Jamshedpur, uh, Lucknow, Pune, and whatever we have seven uh, plants in uh, India, India operation in India, and also we have some plants in UK like JLR, uh, and also we have a lot of learnings. And uh, whatever we do, there is a lot of integration. So, since uh, it's an activity and happening in the say JLR, uh, how it is being done there? Did, when you and same activity, when, when you actually had data that you could show these people like so that you could show them the like cause you know like these precursor states the human errors the, you know sometimes the outcome safety sometimes it's quality sometimes it's production sometimes it's customer relations sometimes it's all four right you get hurt you waste time you waste money and you you damage customer relations like you know all all with all with one incident sometimes it's only production sometimes it's only customer service but you're never trying to make the error so the outcomes and, and where the negative outcomes fall there, there's a lot of chance in all of that you know well except if you're not moving you're not likely going to get hurt but that that connection has been like the you know the purpose of this show that connection has been very weak I mean, even with very positive managers in terms of safety, I, I haven't found too many that made the connection on their own intuitively. You've actually got data, Mr. Pippin. So, I mean, you did, I mean, do they all believe now or are you still dealing with, uh, with, with resistance? And, um, I don't know any anything else that you could share with us. It sounds very interesting doing that. So uh, very rightly told. Actually, there is a, always a challenge uh, to you know make the dot connected. Actually, there is you no know, uh, doubt about it, and it is a journey of excellence. So yeah. what I can share about our journey uh, about Tata Motors, basically uh, we we were actually earlier celebrating you know the zero incidents. Actually, incidents happened. Now uh, the, there is a paradigm shift in thought process. We are actually 
uh, you know, creating those uh, behavior, actually it is being said. So we have a seven, uh, seven point actions, actually, I can tell you. On the seven action, actually, we have uh, started doing, you know, focus on lag to lead, actually. So we have uh, we had a very robust, net, uh, you know, framework of the lead indicators. And these lead indicators are actually uh, going to tell us what is going to happen. And there's a very strong correlation between lead and lag. The second uh, action is actually our, uh, you know, uh, incentives were basically based on your, uh, you know, injury. Somebody has made the zero injury we should give in. Of course, we uh, celebrate those, but somebody is making a very good safe behavior in the shop floor. And uh, any anything, somebody is coming with so many uh, good stories. So we actually try to uh, give them a very strong r and mechanism, reward and recognition mechanism to encourage the, you know, positive aspect of the safety. The third point is actually would, would earlier want, we used to have a would you, just a minute. Would you, uh, a, yeah, yeah. Would you, if you yeah. if you did a if you did an intervention, say on fatigue, um, if if you had somebody come in and do some training for your folks on shift work, um, maybe rearranging the shifts to be a bit more you know copacetic with the circadian rhythm, could you actually? test like defect like would you be able to measure like quality safety production efficiency improvements based on an intervention like something like would is your system actually got that kind of capability in terms of its data collection like if you yes. made an inter if you made an intervention to reduce rushing i'm not saying you will like take you know take a production incentive system away, you'll likely be the dead man. But um, nevertheless, I mean, if you if you decreased rushing, would, would your data collection system actually be robust that you could you could track the improvements from that intervention through production quality, safety and customer relations? Yes. So, wow. um, uh, you, you, you have rightly told about that actually so uh, this is actually uh, uh, we have adopted the uh, the dr kano model also you know the tqm model so that is actually daily work management as you said rightly told that the safety every meeting start with safety in the soft floor in the contractual they take that uh, safety oath they take the you know any uh, uh, unwritten job that they, they, they take to take to or something like that so basically, we have a very uh, mechanism of PDCA and uh, SDCA, and basically each uh, 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 outcomes are being measured in a very very different. Uh, this thing is a very strong analysis on the uh, what has happened, and then quality and safety are not being actually separated uh, in our uh, scenario. Of course, there are challenges, but uh, you know the uh, the committees, the integration of the efforts are going. Beyond our production uh, uh, department, they are going to all service departments as well. So there is a very good interconnectivity. To tell you something more about our vendors and contractors, they were a really a challenging uh, community. So we have made a very strong process of uh, vendor safety management manual, and we had uh, actually training capability on their need based. And through that, actually, we have uh, been able to uh, get a very good, uh, you know, uh, results in terms of the lead indicator. Now they are encouraged to report all the near misses, and all the near misses are actually being acted upon. So you can see that a fortune lies, uh, you know, Henry Strangle. If you see that the bottom of pyramid, so there is our fortune lies actually. Our mindset change has been a, uh, you know, the key differentiator in uh, achieving whatever we are achieving. And but still, I can say that challenges are still there because uh, you know there is a dynamic system the people who are trained they are going out of system new people are coming so our processes which are robust in the capability building and it is actually coming from the need based assessment you know in the training it's not like a general training we are doing we are doing a very very focused training and on uh, the shop floor we had started one program called action employee can take which actually they are empowered so uh, you can see that empowering people and then uh, actually encouraging them engaging them Basically, has been our culture. So, if we, so if we uh, go, I mean, safety is a function of culture, go. as we, uh, I mean, all of us agree about that. So, there is uh, uh, always a culture which is going to drive that actually. Okay. Well, I think the, I, I think from all of you, um, I don't know if Dr. Praveena, uh, her internet cut out. Sorry, I'm not able to uh, hear you, uh, Larry. Oh, okay. Well, um, 
I can hear you. I, I don't know if everybody else can hear me or not. Um, but uh, yes, we can. We are just about, well, we're a little over. Am I on the it, It's not 100% set here. Um, but in general, you know, the very similar to North America, um, the managers, you know, you, there, there's a belief that safety excellence is, is part of business excellence performance. Like, you know, nobody's, nobody's arguing with that. The, the number of managers that have figured it out in terms of cause and, and working on human error versus just removing hazards, um, there's some of them that get it, some of them that uh, don't quite understand it yet. And I, like I said at the beginning, some that some that don't care. Um, with you, some of you uh, managed- Larry, I'm not, I'm not able to, uh, I'm not able to hear you properly. Okay, well, it's okay. You, you don't need to say anything anymore. I'm gonna just try to close it out. So it's all, it's all right if you can hear me, Mr. Biffin, I don't know, but- um, uh, so anyhow, the, the, there's certainly the belief um, that, that safety excellence is part of business excellence. Um, cause versus correlation seems no matter where you go, Europe, uh, I've done this, North America, um, I, I can't speak Spanish, so I wasn't on the webinars in, in Latin America, but not necessarily a lot of them that, that are right there yet with terms of cause or, or, or that understand, you know, human error, critical error, human factors as precursor states. Um, so, you know, still, still a ways to go. Um, some of you got it down to your supervisors. Some of you got it down to, to the employees still struggling a bit with the, with the contractors. So, um, a very interesting discussion, everybody. And I, I'd really like to thank you very much for participating in this. Um, the next expert panel that we are going to be doing, um, just let me uh, make sure I get the date right here. And this is another topic near and dear to my heart. Um, injury prevention strategies, for young workers and old workers, how do you deal with the two highest risk categories? And this does go back to 30 years ago. I remember, you know, cause I was selling safety training videotapes and um, I walked into this guy's office and um, you know, they'd had some injuries and I thought I was likely gonna sell some videotapes. And he looks at me and he says, Larry, Young guys get hurt more than the old guys, but it's the old guys who die. And I was in the oil patch 30 years ago. And I, you know, that, that was a conundrum because you could understand why young workers who didn't have any safety training would get hurt. But people that have 20, 30 years experience, be hard to say that it's because they didn't know how to weld at this stage of the game. They've been a journeyman welder for 25 years. So um, I, I had trouble with that one. I really hope you could all, all, all of you gentlemen could join us for this next webinar. And, and you can tell us what you did, because you, obviously you've got to have the same rules and procedures. You can't have different rules and procedures for young new workers than you do for old workers. That's all got to be exactly consistent. But I don't imagine any of you talk to somebody with 15 years experience the same way you talk to somebody who's been working for you for 15 days. I can't imagine you'd use the same approach. So I'd really like to hear, you know, from you, what, what's worked for you, what's worked for your, your plants and your companies. Um, and this one is going to be um on february the 18th uh same time 10 30 uh a.m india standard time uh old workers and young workers effective strategies for the two highest risk groups um gentlemen and dr pravina i don't know if you're if you're there whatever but um thank you all very very much for for your time 
Um, Mr. Biffin, sorry about the, the technical difficulties you had, um, but al almost always one of these webinars, somebody has some technical difficulties somewhere. So please, please don't feel bad. And, and thank you all very much. And um, hopefully we'll we'll have you all back in uh, in about a month and you can tell us what you do in terms of stuff that works for the old guys and for the young guys. Because uh, those are the two highest risk categories. They still are. And that's 30 years later. So thank you very much, everybody. Really appreciate it. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank thank you, thank you Larry. Thank you, all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.